and I said uh, between between web and fashion, and I started this label Pamoyo a few years ago, five six years ago, and um, in the beginning the main objective was to do things to take a bit better care of like the social and the environmental side than most other labels, and at the time there was also hardly nothing going on in terms of eco-fashion, it was just kind of starting to, to come up. But then, it was probably because I had this influence from that I was also developing websites, I was using open source software, but I wasn't really giving so much back to that, that scene. Somewhere there along came the idea to just, well, why not also just release the patterns and um, to make this an, an open source label. It was like an experiment or just like an idea quite quickly. And so, yeah, I'm going to talk about this and also about this event and a bit different about open practices in fashion. And like now with this thing, it's like you can, you can either talk about open source in a very strict way, whereas it means that things get shared in certain ways, that they can be used, that they're documented and that they have open licenses and a more like this, a more narrower kind of view that would a lot come from software. On the other hand, I was used to kind of, I, I see this as a bit more open and very pragmatic. But this time, it's also like if you look at open source fashion, you will find very few things. There is not so much. But this is on the other hand, not that there is no one engaging uh, with this in this way. I think it's more because there's very few fashion designers that have anything to do, for example, with the tech world, which the, also the open design as well as the, the whole like open source movement has been for a long time. So there's very, there's not so much connection points for many people, I think, who works in fashion. On the other hand, there's the, the DIY revolution and, and the whole craftivist movement, which has a lot to do with, yeah, well, with clothes production and with fashion, which is huge in the fashion industry. And there's so much of these things that are basically the same. And it's also with DIY tutorials, you will find loads of them shared openly. So maybe not with certain licenses or so, but the way certain skills and certain just methods and ways of doing things and also designs are shared, it's really big there. So I'm also talking, I mean, it's like DIY and open source. There's different names for a certain movement of things that are basically talking about the same things. Um, so, thing. Um, yeah, I just start off with this um, quote. Fashion is a form of ugliness so intolerable that we have to alter it every six months. There's a certain tension in this quote. Um, I think that, that talks a lot about how fashion design, there is something that, that's constantly moving on and it's not stopping and it's constantly moving away from where it is right now. Um, the thing that I find interesting with this quote is that I, I posted it recently on some Facebook or something. And basically, all the people who like this were the people who work in the fashion industry, which actually I thought it would be differently. But um, so, so, so fashion in this way, I mean, it's, it's constantly striving to be something different. On the one hand, it's about beauty. Yeah, but we, our beauty ideals don't change all the time. I mean, we have certain perceptions of beauty, but fashion keeps on moving also because it wants to be exclusive in some way, or it wants to be somewhere um, and to be on a, on a cutting edge and, and to look different than it was doing yesterday. And in this sense, fashion isn't also not very equal. It's not about democratization, it's not about everyone being the same. So this contradicts a bit open practices, like to actually, this thing of how you want to like stick out and be very special. Um, then on the other hand, um, Sam was also mentioning now when he talked about clothing and, and fashion, about this democratization process. Um, and I would say, actually, like within the whole clothing and fashion, this democratization in the first hand, it took place when the mass production came along. Um, because, I'm going to say, no, we're not there. Um, before that, it was all hot quartier, and it wasn't really something that was very accessible for many people. Until mass production came, and this, the prices went down, and actually, like, a much broader group of people could have access 
to much more things. And this has just increased, of course. So now you can get anything and that like the difference, so like how the high street is copying the designers all the time and at which speed means that you can get for a very low budget very many things. But I think most of us here also know that this caused a lot of problems. This is not a very positive democratization. It's nice in one way, but um, it's also, yeah, for the environment and for the people who have to make these things, not so good. Um, and it's also like, I mean, you're supposed to, you can like wear your clothes to express who you are, and you do express who you are, but if you're going to express your personal style with mass-produced items, that gets kind of tricky. And I think that's when like, they hold this DIY and open approach and actually interacting more yourself and hands-on with your clothes comes back in again, finding ways to actually alter all these mass-produced pieces becomes something special. So now, um, as well as like Sam was before me now, so he was taking all my points. Yeah? I was thinking, oh, if it goes on like this, I have nothing to say anymore. Um, so yeah, fashion. Um, it, it's already, it's open. Like it's, it's a complete, it's like a free culture. It differs a bit in the Europe, it's a bit different than in the States when it comes to copyright and so on, how far you can protect patterns. But I think it comes down to generally, it's like in the EU, you can protect your designs, but it doesn't mean anything because you can protect too much. In the States, you can basically not protect anything unless it's very, very kind of very odd hot quatur. Because in the end, a t-shirt is a t-shirt and there is not big enough differences to, to protect these things. So there comes this interesting paradox where it actually, so when I started Promoyo and I launched it as an open source label, then I found out that obviously it was the world's first. And everyone found it kind of, some people found it really strange, others interesting, whatever, but it was like a novelty. But I was actually not doing anything different except that I was releasing these patterns. So I think that on the one hand, fashion is open, but there's, it's not viewed as such within this industry because it's still about like, it's mine, 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 mine. That's my idea and don't steal it. And so there is this strong idea of ownership over ideas and over designs. And on the other hand, it's, it's a whole thing. The whole, it's, it's all based on copying. There wouldn't be any trends if they wouldn't be copying and everyone is copying. And yeah, so basically without it, this industry wouldn't exist in this form if people weren't copying. Um, so, so yes, on the one hand, like, in the fashion industry, it is already open in the sense that people already do copy each other and all of this. So I find it more interesting. It's like, how can you actually open this box to the, to the people who wear it and to the consumers? Because that's where the big wall is. So like one hand, in the production facilities, they just, you know, they can just put it in the copy machine and, and make their own version and they do this. But there is... For the rest, big efforts to keep up a wall between the people who wear it and the people who create it, to keep up the whole mystery and the myth and, and again, this exclusivity um, that fashion has, and, and to make it kind of special. And it's a lot of smoke and mirrors and um, all these things. Um, so I've noticed I'm doing a lot of workshops with people um, and a lot what it's about is actually opening your clothes. And with some things, like with an iPhone, you know, you have to, you can use a stone or something. It's quite easy to open them, but then they won't work. Um, but with clothes, it's like as easy as this. It's actually, so it's something which is like also super accessible to get hands on with. You don't need any particular things, actually. You can actually just cut it up. And even though it's so easy, there's so much people actually don't. I've come to realize uh, more and more. Um, so I'll get back to that. But so, so for me, if you look at these this different definitions of what open fashion could be, one thing is to take this, this strict classic uh, definition of, of the source code. So what the source code of fashion is, of course, it's the patterns. Um, so, so this is now a very old pattern from the 16th century um, from a Spanish guy, 
Juan de Alcega. Um, it's a jacket. Um, yeah, so that's like, so if you can share when you share the patterns, you can have ways to alter the patterns. Um, this is a good thing. The, pr the problem a bit is that when you get into it is that it, actually, of course, there's software to do this. Um, but the software which is available on the market, basically, and that actually is good to work with, it's all proprietary and it's very expensive licenses. So the effect is that basically all smaller fashion houses, individual designers, like everyone who is more or less corporate and has a lot of cash, they work on paper. And they work on paper patterns, and those are not digital, and those are not digital to share very easily. Uh, now, so I've been experimenting with it. I've been so digitalizing patterns. Here is like, so here is one to the left. It's a jacket from a collection of mine. You can find that on GitHub. And there is some part of a website. Um, so you can get them to get quite close to each other, but again, there is a little gap of software available so you need. So here is some pictures from my collection. So yeah, so I started with Pamoyo. It was just like an ordinary label, um, except for that we were releasing the patterns. But like ordinary in the sense of I just sold clothes, and that's what I made my money from. But then I digitalized the patterns and shared them for download. Um, and um, Yeah. So it was doing this for a few rounds. And that worked quite well um, in the sense of that I think there were some people were kind of, we get in touch with a lot of people and people kind of making it for themselves a bit. But it was lacking a bit to actually make it fully open source. We need to have this software, which is something like I recognize now what Sam was also showing um, for this parametric underwear. Been researching different solutions for this um, and working on projects, but it wasn't fully there. So, so this has been something I've been experimenting with for for a couple of years and trying to make them. So, like having this really like Creative Commons licensed um, patterns available. In the end, I couldn't make it to make all the to get all the designs out there, but. It was still really worth a try. And then, so a lot like what Pamoyu in the end has been a lot. On the one hand, it's a brand. On the other hand, a lot of my, my research lab for trying out what kind of open source ways of working with fashion can work, or maybe not. So whereas people love to hear success stories, and I would love to be able to tell you like this great business idea uh, for making a lot of cash which I can't, because it's, you know, it wasn't a very commercially successful project, but it made me very rich in trying out these things. And I think it's also because I've been working with this open source way of working, it was a bit like you set your baby free out in the world, and then you don't have any control anymore. So, so now, like six years later, if it wasn't for that, actually I was open sourcing these things and spreading these things over the internet and everything, I might have forgotten about it. But now it's actually impossible because it keeps on coming back to me as well. So, I mean, I'm still making it. I'm making like quite irregularly creating collections still, but on a smaller scale and sometimes releasing patterns. And now I'm just starting on a, on a new round of, of started working with putting a repository in GitHub with open fashion and starting to feed old patterns into that and see where it comes to. And it will come up some new designs as well. So, Apart from the, so another like, thing that was very important for me with Pamoyo was that I always worked with upcycling. So of using the resource of worn clothing, which is basically, it, it's so much there, but it's hard to get it back into the loop of production. So I was trying to find ways where you can actually use this resource, which is there at our doorsteps, so like in, in all of you's wardrobe probably, Everyone's got the stuff that it's, it's still fine, but you might not want to wear it anymore. Um, 
and use that. And so basically all of these things, also it's all upcycling material. It all comes from. And then actually it was the, by this collection, it's a kids collection, I did one. Um, this was also the first that then the, this research came to the point, okay, now we're going to really try it out to see how this works on a production line of creating like more how the serial production will work. So whereas in a, before that had worked more on very small production rounds and directly with seamstresses, and maybe more like 20, 30 pieces at a time, which is still a kind of, it's a scale where things are really easy to keep under control with all this, with the upcycling as well. Then with these things, there was the first time that I worked entirely with just an other, with a production studio in Berlin, in Neukölln. Um, it was in super small scale. It was just maybe like 100 pieces. But already taking that step makes things entirely much more like the logistics, very, very different. So, so basically, there was, became this great collection, all upcycled and produced, and in some way it actually worked to make a kind of serial production out of it. On the other hand, the resources that it took, which is way too big. Um, so I kind of went on and I learned a lot from it and when I'm looking for other uh, ways of how you could do it, where it actually maybe would work, not only that you got clothing out of it, but that would also work as a business model. Um, here is some clothing. I think this is that jacket that the break dancer is wearing. So this has been basically, this is the way I've been sharing designs in various formats like editable vector files and as PDFs for people to download and print out at home um, to use. So, and I think in most cases I know when people have been using our designs, it's, um, it's been people making stuff for themselves and maybe more than designers, they would, their own things. Um, so, so there's like this thing with the, the upcycling of, which means to use things that like it's different than recycling, but it's more like to use material, to use ways to make something better. Um, because, so, so fashion, it's like basically, I mean, in the end, the things that there is clothes and then there is this thing with fashion is that it's maybe 90% of it is the whole, the image around it and it's the whole, the presentation and the representation of clothes, the photo shoots, the, just this image building is like so more important than the actual clothes which also makes it possible now we have all these chic things hanging in stores, but what are they made of? Like, and where do they come from? It doesn't really matter because you've got this really nice billboard, like showing the nice picture instead of what it's really like. So I've been working partly, well, this is, this is from Uganda. It's a guy growing cotton, also among cotton we've been using um, for our collections, but that's really far away and it's not so, um, so it just takes a bit more resources to get it there. Um, and yeah, here, some of these clothes that, that we have plentiful of. I think in Germany alone, there is, no one really knows, but there is an estimated 80 to 100,000 tons of clothing that every year gets thrown out in containers. Um, and if you would, that's a, it's kind of estimated, like if you would hang that on a clothing line to dry, it would take you from the earth to the moon. And that's like every year and only in Germany. So there is, there's so much clothes that are just being like thrown out and they're kind of perfectly fine. And one thing is when it's trash and it's worn out, but there's very few garments that actually make it that far. So, so that's basically, there is like, you have all these clothes. And as I was telling you before, there was this thing about the production of this, the kids collection, which was getting like logistically, it was just not really working out because it is really hard to get the things back into a loop the way it's built up. Like, so our, our standard model for producing clothes can't really swallow that. It will get like a lot of hiccups on the way. Um, so you will have basically have to, to look at it from a totally different way, like, but how can you actually use this? Because some way you should be able to use this material. One way, of course, is to rip it all up and make new yarn of it and weave a new garment. Then you can have fabric 
And you can do it as you used to. You cut out pieces and you sew them together again and you have a new garment. But with some things, it's a bit of shame to, to do that whole process when actually, when it's like, if you say you have a silk dress and it's worn two times, but it was a very weird fashiony model that kind of went out of its time and there's no reason for, for anyone to want to wear it again. Um, so that's where we started Fashion Reloaded four years ago. Um, Fashion Reloaded is a swapping party and remake event. It's been taking place in Berlin and in a bit other places too. And we started on the one hand to actually find more different ways to just try out with people about what can we do with our clothes, the things we don't want to wear anymore. What can we make out of it? And the other part was actually we wanted to kind of try to collect some of this recycled clothing to make stuff out of it also, to just kind of try to build, build a, a model for, for collecting clothes and, and doing other things with them as well. And that's actually something. So like, there's so much clothes that are being thrown away. On the other hand, it goes into a closed system of dealing with secondhand clothing, uh, where it's really hard to get access to. So uh, it's kind of, I think they are a bit like car dealers or something in, in transparency. Um, so, so instead, we just kind of, we, we just invited our friends and their friends and their friends. So we were a few hundred people. Um, to get together to swap, which is like when you bring stuff you don't need anymore, you trade it with other people, you walk around away with a new wardrobe. We combine this with remake workshops, where we basically set up workplaces, workshops, um, where people also without experience, with very low threshold, just go in and create things they wanted to wear, and they would have support from professionals when they needed it. These are some posters from the first one, by the way. Um, so yeah, what we're trying to promote with this event is not necessarily don't consume um, at all. Because, I mean, let's face it, it's nice to have nice things. And we, it's, it's hard to tell people, like, yeah, you shouldn't shop any more clothes because you have enough. It might be true, but it doesn't work. We also like nice things, and, and sometimes you want to reinvent yourself. You need something new and something fresh, and this is okay. It's just that we were looking like, but so how can we just consume differently? Um, so this is, this is the standard model. It's the one-way consumption, where you think, I, I need something. I like something like that. You go to the shop, and you buy it, you wear it, and you throw it away. And it makes you kind of sad, as you can see in our diagram. It's been statistically proven. So, and this is the model which, where you can gain much more. Like, where you, where you instead of just doing it one way, you just do the multiple choice um, consumption, where you can buy things, you can give it to a friend, you can throw it away, you can take it out again, and you can you talk about it, and you alter it. And this, of course, a topic has been coming up a lot this weekend, so I think um, I don't need to get very far into it. But this is basically, so this is the Fashion Reloaded uh, Consumption Utopia. And that's probably not even a shop there, it's a vintage shop. Um, and so what, what Fashion Reloaded also is a lot, it's, it is an event and it's doing workshops, but it's also to, like, to create a platform to kind of, with a lot of different people and different creative people from different backgrounds, to find ways of actually dealing with clothes. Also to share skills, um, and to come up with ideas what we're going to do with this thing, to share inspiration. And yeah, so on one hand, get together clothes and trade them. Um, and create stuff out of it. We also consciously, we've almost never done this twice in one place, but always, we always, the event has always been moving from one place to the other, uh, so that we would every time also meet um, a new audience. Because this is the thing, when I started 
to talk about the thing of how you open fashion. Um, is you just, you know, you, it can be enough that you just cut into it and it's so easy. And at the same time, I've been seeing time over and over again in these workshops that people actually don't. That I always have people, they never even cut into a t-shirt. And how even, it's, it doesn't really matter how simple an action it is, there's still like, there's a moment when it's the first time you interact with the garment because you wear clothes every day. Um, and whereas you can stop seeing them as finished objects and start seeing them as something that you can actually interact with that is maybe not necessarily finished and it's not like some kind of un untouchable product of genius from another planet, which is very special. So on one hand that, only very simple actions, but also with, with sewing in general, using sewing machines, and, and likely that... Um, yeah, I'd always have, I'm kind of surprised that how many people actually never use these things. And I think it's kind of, and it is very easy, but some, so, it, so we kind of help by just giving this push that we are there to help people. But I have people, 70 year old women, eight year old boys, everything in between. And the kind of the fewest of them have actually been sewing before. So we are not like a f network of fashionistas that um, that create new things, but it's basically like we work a lot, we try to kind of just find people who are actually not so engaged, but then also mix them up with people who are very engaged in fashion. Um, and also work a lot together with other artists, so have like basically just create events where you can have a good atmosphere and you can work together, so that this getting into this making um, it's like easy and, and also just a party and a kind of an enjoyable way of changing the world in small steps. Um, and so on the one hand, I mean, we, we teach people tricks, how to do things, but I definitely don't do sewing courses. And I'm very much refusing to do so. Um, and now the time goes really fast, so I'll speak very quickly. But the most important things with this is like, I think it's great if people, you know, work, live and do everything, you know, make stuff their, themselves and stop buying things. But I I'm also don't think it's going to happen really quickly. Uh, but what this does is that there is like this general uh, lack of like, when you just go shopping all the time, the stuff becomes a bit hollow and... Um, and, and lose their values, so you go buy, buy more things. But actually, when people start interacting with their objects and start making things, you can kind of start building a connection again and, and start building like this affectionate connection to the stuff that you wear and that you have. And I think so on the one hand, it's a problem with the whole, this environmental issues in fashion and stuff. And it's great that there's a lot of labels who now do this differently. On the other hand, when you only produce the same things, but then green, it still doesn't really change the mentality. It might change that things will be more expensive, so you will have to kind of cut back on your consumption. But, but it is when you engage in actually the process of making stuff that you can start having a bit of an, another emotional bonding to objects and, and treat your, your consumption differently. I think my time is out, huh? Here is a collection um, we've done with Fashion Reloaded. Um, and uh, can I have can I two more? I get two more minutes. I also wanted to mention another project I've been involved with that if you were here last year, I think you know about this because there was someone from them here. Uh, but Openware, it's an online community and platform um, for an open source brand. Um, and fashion label, and I was part of the initial group, initial group to create the first collection in 2010, which you can see on the picture. So it's basically a community where people can register, and then there is a collection which is not being produced by Openware, but you can download the patterns, and you can produce and sell it yourself, or you can produce it for yourself, or you might find someone over the platform who, who produces it for you. Um, so it's 
is about like finding a totally like finding new connections globally and locally between producers and consumers of fashion. Um, yeah, I um, so I'm running out of time. So I think, um, but if someone has questions, I would be very glad to take them. Do we have any questions for Cecilia? Yeah, there's a question there. Sí. Hola Cecilia, te voy a preguntar en castellano, no sé si... Vale. Eh... Espera, espera un momentito. Ya. Yeah. Yeah. Adelante. Yeah, sorry. Eh, en, digamos que viendo un poco el, bueno, el mundo de la moda y cómo es verdad que siempre todo se ha copiado, ¿no? aunque siempre ha habido todos esos miedos y cuando ibas a, a las ferias de moda está todo eso de que no te dejan entrar para que no hagas fotos y tal, pero claro, eso ya no, no, no existe, ¿no? Y digamos que siempre ha habido el mundo de las revistas de patrones y. Pero mmm, pensando en que se copia el diseño, ¿no? Y entonces, eh, digamos que los que tienen mucha capacidad de producir y distribuir y vender sacan bastante más rentabilidad a, a la posibilidad del mundo de la copia, ¿no? Y de la reutilización de recursos. Y quizá eh, la clave está en cómo acceder al mercado desde la, la parte logística, ¿no? O sea, que si podríamos pensar ¿no? en un modelo para que, digamos que la copia o la utilización de recursos comunes sea más justa que del mismo modo que se copian o podemos copiar todos los diseños que también podamos utilizar sus canales logísticos y sus tiendas, por ejemplo, ¿no? O sea, que, que Inditex ponga a nuestra disposición su planta de logística de Zaragoza, sus tiendas y tal, y que realmente así pensemos en el uso de recursos comunes, ¿no? Porque si no, claro, los diseñadores o la parte que crea y comparte, ¿no? Eh, siempre es como el eslabón débil de la cadena de copia, ¿no? Entonces, a ver cómo ves tú eso en el ámbito de la moda, ¿no? Porque al final está la parte de diseñar, pero luego de crear el valor de marca también, todo ese tipo de cosas, ¿no? ¿Qué opinas sobre ello? Um... So, let me take that off, <laughs> the echo. Um, yeah, it is, of course, an issue that those, that the creators are not, they don't make so much money. And I think it's the same in, the, in my case, in the way I work, that if you do pioneering work, you also won't make any money. And in which sense that I think that a lot of, if you look at open design business models, that they might not be the ones who generate the most money, but they generate other kinds of value. Because mostly it's the things that, things that generate like value for society don't generate money. And I think this is, it is more like in an, in an opposite um, curve. But so uh, what I found is that, of course I got this question many times of like, but don't you want to make money? And, But how can you share your designs? It's like the designer's jewel. But in our case, it was also, I mean, we made the things first and then we share it and then we moved on to somewhere else. So it's only like it's increased our um, exposure um, to, um, to our users. Um, but I think also in general, like that this within the, the techs and, and these big guys, They are making money on because some people are not getting paid and they also can't there's like there will be a stop somewhere where they can't keep on making their money the way it goes um, even though it might not come super soon but where it would be great if we could make it to kind of use their infrastructure for for another purpose um, it's a great idea yeah um, I'm gonna I'm, I'm really not sure I answered your question, but yeah, as an attempt. Um, I'm going 
going to participate a bit in this dialogue, probably. In my opinion, Cecilia, and we talked earlier about it, is probably this type of practice in the, about open source and uh, uh, collaborative design on fashion. It's more about uh, diversi diversifying the, the market. I mean, I think that uh, as fashion designers or fashion activists, we don't really want to be a part of Inditex chain, but we are trying to uh, research and to open, open other type of uh, possibilities to be in different type of channels of distribution, uh, possibly not in the shops or in the, in the or be a big part of, of the big chain, but try to see how we can manage these new tools to create other possibilities and to uh, educate new, new behaviors of consumerism. I don't know. I think that probably uh, in, in terms of using these tools in fashion, we are exploring. It's a design discipline who is a bit, um, I'm going to change into Spanish. Está probablemente un poco, ah, sorry, Cecilia, I'm going to change. It's difficult for me to say what I want to say. My head goes faster than my mouth. Creo que en el mundo de la moda eh, está bastante por detrás que otras disciplinas del diseño. Yo siempre hago una analogía con la gastronomía, por ejemplo. ¿no? Si cuando la gente se empieza a plantear somos lo que llevamos, eh, como nos planteamos somos lo que comemos, estaremos probablemente a un mismo nivel cultural en la moda. Creo que estas herramientas están abriendo en el mundo de la moda otros canales que tienen que ver con implosionar el propio sistema de la moda. No con buscar alianzas con él o con eh, ver cómo podemos ser parte de él, sino con explorar otras vías de, bueno, de ir hacia otro lugar a través de, del diseño y a través de la producción y a través de la distribución y a través de la co-creación y a través del, del co en general. No sé si es tanto ver cómo podemos meternos en él, sino ver cómo podemos cargárnoslo o diversificar. No, no es... No, me he pasado. Igual no es cargárnoslo, pero igual es sí, más... Pues eso, diversificar. Y lo que sí creo que tiene la moda es un, una maravillosa posibilidad para acercarnos a las personas. Eh, es un lenguaje muy sencillo que todo el mundo entiende, porque todo el mundo se viste. Y probablemente los gaps comunicativos que las herramientas de diseño abierto y que tienen, y que son muchas veces lenguajes muy complejos y conceptos muy complejos, pues a través de la moda, que es un lenguaje muy común, se pueden canalizar de forma muy fácil, con prácticas que todo el mundo puede entender de forma muy sencilla. I also would like to add something to this uh, uh, thing, and that's, I think, some a part which is very important is that, yeah, well, actually, I would, I would destroy Inditex any time uh, if I could, but I can't. Um, but the problem is that goods, especially clothing, because it's being consumed so much, like second to food, probably the most, it's been so strongly devalued that it's really difficult for independent designers and smaller companies to survive because no one is ready, like people have bon gotten too accustomed to a t-shirt costing five euros or 10 euros. And it takes some to explain to them that that's not okay. And that's also the thing like while you, when you get into actually making stuff, there is also this consciousness start coming in that maybe it's not okay what they're doing and maybe next time I'm going to be ready to pay more for something which is actually valuable. So at all getting this like value for the proper craft back what the mass production has been taking away. Thank you very much, Cecilia. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thanks.